great. Thank you uh, so much. So uh, ancient Egypt, it's one of the earliest and most celebrated examples of a so-called pristine uh, state. I don't have a lot of time to explain exactly what happened, so I'm going to give you a very quick and dirty overview of what archaeologists think uh, happened. But basically, around 4000 BC, we have evidence of the earliest permanent settled farming communities uh, appearing on the edges of the Nile Valley. Uh, Egyptologists tend to refer to them as roughly egalitarian farming communities with a little dif evidence of social differentiation. Oops, sorry. Uh, and, um, uh, yeah. Sorry, it's working. Yeah. A uh, little evidence of social differentiation is apparent in, in, the, in the record. And then from there, we can witness a growth of settlements uh, plus social stratification in burials. And we can see movement of villages into the floodplain from the desert fringes. Uh, proper. And so that by circa 3500 or 3400, uh, what we have um, particularly in Upper Egypt, the area that's shaded in orange, is the emergence of city-states uh, with urban features, uh, conglomerations of uh, larger settlements with satellite settlements around them, social stratification, specialization, craft, um, and the emergence of long-distance trade and so forth. Uh, from there, uh, it seems that uh, from around 3400 onwards, these city-states grow and compete and eventually coalesce, um, maybe out of warfare, maybe out of elite cooperation, it's not really clear. Um, but uh, at the same time, they also expand their influence northwards, such that by 3100 or thereabouts, the whole Nile Valley from the first cataract near Aswan all the way to the Mediterranean is uh, a politically unified territorial state ruled by a single god king, Right, the pharaohs that everyone knows uh, and loves. <laughs> so uh, the big question, of course, is how? And this has been a question of interest to Egyptologists since the beginning of Egyptology. Um, if at the beginning of the fourth millennium, the Nile Valley was populated by small, roughly egalitarian farming communities with a handful of households each scattered up and down the Nile Valley, what factor or factors set off a process leading to the emergence of subtle agglomeration and urban urbanization? social hierarchy, and extreme income inequality that's so dramatic uh, to such an extent uh, that what we have are massive tomb complexes that belong to the pharaohs with huge amounts of luxury grave goods, and at least in the first dynasty, accompanied by burials of their assistants and retainers who, according to the bone evidence, were probably sacrificed at the time of the king's death. So a very extremely high level of economic and social uh, disparity going on there. Uh, so although the changing climatic conditions of around 4,500 onwards can explain why villages perhaps popped up on in the Nile Valley, it doesn't explain the initial change from small collections of households to something more complex. Now there have been a lot of theories and explanations have been put forward for the rise of complex polities and states, not just for Egypt, but most of these don't really hold up to scrutiny. And I'm, I'm not going to go through the, all of these in detail because we don't have enough time, but basically some of the older theories, hydraulic theory, military threat, trade, population pressure, um, numerous scholars have observed that these just simply do not apply to the circumstances of pre-dynastic Egypt. Uh, population pressure is one that's mentioned, I think, several times, but all of the surveys that have been done uh, in the Nile Valley, they all come to the same conclusion, and that's the Nile Valley was underpopulated in the pre-dynastic period, and that there was a lot of resources. It's a very, um, the Nile River and its floodplain, it's very subsistence friendly. There, with the annual inundation, the Nile refreshed and fertilized the fields. There's uh, anim an abundance of animals, um, and there's just not enough evidence of that the, the population ever uh, even came close to exceeding this or going beyond this. So wh what are people doing now? Well, there's no clear consensus. Uh, there's a lot of ongoing debates. Uh, some people are talking about the role of variable, uh, variable Nile flood levels. Uh, some people still insist that a state can only be formed out of armed conflict. Uh, there's debates about hierarchy. Is it imposed from the top down or is it emergent from the bottom up? Um, does wealth inequality in the archaeological record even equal hierarchy or power imbalance? These are just an, a, a number of things that are currently being debated in the literature. Uh, a good, I think, a positive step is that many uh, Egyptologists are now calling for Egypt to be treated as a complex adaptive system um, that's uh, you know, evolving in the current literature now, but still 
uh, archaeologists or Egyptologists are still struggling to really narrate the process of the emergence of social complexity and hierarchy in pre-dynastic Egypt. Um, one particular uh, theoretical, theoretical reconstruction that uh, attracted my attention for both its elegance um, and simplicity was Barry Kemp's uh, explanation that he first published in his uh, uh, influential social history of ancient Egypt that was published in 1989. And he likened the whole process to a monopoly game. Uh, he, the way he describes it, we are operating in a landscape of unlimited potential. Uh, initially, all the players are equal in terms of access to resources um, and so on, are all on an equal footing. They compete unconsciously year by year. Um, and the initially egalitarian state doesn't last, right? The advantage changes from player to player through a combination of chance and personal choice. Uh, and eventually the advantage position of one or more players reinforces itself, right? And certain players rise above the others in more or less entrenched ways. Others drop out from boredom or fatigue or so on. Um, you play it out long enough, you have an eventual winner. In Kemp's scenario, then you have a pharaoh. Uh, so in, in Kemp's version, then, the factors leading to growth and social complexity are the landscape and the environment, uh, chance, and personal decisions. Um, now, this is very, it looks really good on paper, um, but what I was really curious is, can we interrogate it? It's still a bit vague, right? And I thought that maybe the best way to do that was through a computational model. So that's what this project uh, is about. It's constructing an agent-based model to explore uh, to probe, to interrogate Kemp's conceptual model in computational form, uh, to explore how a combination of human decision-making, environmental factors, and chance interconnect to result in the settlement system and the rise of social complexity that we witness in the archaeological record. Um, at this point, what we're especially focused on is the earlier part of the process, from around 3700 BC, um, right when the uh, smaller communities are starting to aggregate and when we start to see um, the appearance of uh, wealth inequality. So, um, are the design of our agent-based model, and I should start by saying I'm completely new to ABM. My background is textual analysis and artifact analysis. So, if what I describe now, if you think it's terrible, that's probably why. Um, this is very much for me kind of an exploration of what ABM can do to help me as a historian and archaeologist uh, present better narratives of the past. So, um, the basic uh, model is programmed in NetLogo. It simulates a section of the Nile floodplain uh, in Upper Egypt. The uh, empirical data, first of all, comes from, um, the topographical data comes from NASA, uh, and then the data I'm using for the Nile behavior comes from geoarchaeological geo data, uh, as well as historical data on flood levels that we have going back to the 7th century AD, um, but in particular precise 19th century measurements we have of the Nile River and uh, flood levels from year to year, from season to season. Uh, the world setup, uh, how I'm doing it for the moment, it's 100 by 100 patches. Each patch equals approximately 0 0.05 square kilometers. Um, I imported the NASA data using the uh, GIS uh, extension in that logo. And for the moment, uh, the world that I have has 50 settlements randomly distributed with, with restrictions um, in terms of where they can be. They can't be too close together, they can't be too close to the Nile or too far away. Um, seven households per settlement, five persons per household. This I'm extracting from the data provided by Egyptologists. Um, they have, uh, this data is in turn based on archeological surveys and ethno-archeological data uh, from more recent history. Um, as I put in there to remind myself, the problem, there's a huge problem with the data, right? There always is, I guess. Um, at least for in the case of early Egypt, the floodplain, right, um, the part that's in green, uh, the floodplain has been continuously inhabited and cultivated for over, for, you know, about 6,000 years, right? So it's extremely hard to do any kind of survey, much less excavation in that area. Most of the survey that has been done is in the desert fringes. Most of our data for pre dynastic Egypt comes from cemeteries. Very little comes from actual settlements. So there's a whole methodological issue of how do you study settlements ancient settlements uh, from cemeteries that I can't get into. Um, at the same time, the other problem is that there just hasn't been that much survey. There's been some, but not the entire area. So the data is very fragmentary and it's inherently problematic. Um, so that's just a big caveat. Um, in terms of the design of the model agents and actions, the primary agent is the household. 
um, thus, in theory, represented by the head of household, and household is used very broadly here. It could be either a family, a single nuclear family, or it could be a bigger estate where you have a family and lots of workers and their dependents attached to it. Um, the sole activity is farming to keep the model simple, and what happens each year is the, the Nile floods. Uh, the model calculates the potential yield for the fields for, the, for this particular year. Uh, Households claim, make decisions about claiming available land, they make decisions about farming, they harvest, they consume, they store their surplus grain, and then the population distributions are adjusted based on the outcome of these activities. So the question then to me was, I was trying to face is what variables to include and how to include them. In particular, I'm very, very, very interested in how we model decision making. And there were some pretty strong opinions expressed about this, I think, earlier in this morning. Uh, so I, I, I go into this with some trepidation, but I'm, I am very concerned about the, the issues of personality, emotion, um, and these are things that have been brought up in some recent literature on agent-based modeling that I just put up here. But um, to kind of extrapolate what's been said in the recent literature and what does it mean for what I'm trying to do here? I like to think about about like this. How do, what are, what are the factors for successful agriculture in ancient Egypt? Of course, the Nile flood level. Of course, topography. Of course, things like pests or whatever. Um, soil fertility, right? Those things are all pretty easy to incorporate into the model, but it's, it's more than that, right? There's a bunch of decisions that are made. Sowing a schedule, management of labor, how uh, a person you know, selects land, chooses land, um, to uh, seed and harvest. And so in, these things are all affected by personality, ability, talent, uh, motivation, and so on. So how do we incorporate those into the model? And that's something I'm um, trying to explore with uh, this project. So um, here are just some of the variables uh, that uh, we use. We have some global variables that apply then to all the agents, things like you know, the potential yield per field, you know, consumption of grain, uh, storage loss rate, things like that. Uh, the patch variables are the soil quality and the elevation. The soil quality changes from year to year. The elevation is fixed. Um, and the elevation then determines whether or not the flood waters right, reach the piece of land. Um, and then the air agent variables, the location, it's fixed for the moment in this current version of the model, just to keep things simple. Um, but the, what does change is um, ambition and competence. And I chose ambition and competence as kind of oversimplified variables to uh, encapsulate a lot of um, personality, right? So ambition would be you know, drive, aggression, and so on. Uh, competence would be you know, uh, just basically you know, ability, um, knowledge, and, and so on. Um, I should also point out that a global variable is the knowledge radius. So agents do have access to the fertility history, the yield history of every field but it's um, uniform, right? They all have access to it. Um, this, and all the knowledge is equal. Um, this is just a, a quick shot of what it looks like in that logo with um, the variables that can be adjusted by the user, didn't play around with, and then the reporters uh, over there. And um, we, I've run a ton of different experiments, played around with all kinds of different levels and so on, and I just want to briefly talk about two sample experiments. Um, the first experiment was one where I basically made all of the agents uh, very, very smart, very competent. They're, they're all the best. They have all the best knowledge. They have all the best people. Uh, they're, they are 100% um, ready to go. And then experiment two was then to give them varying levels of ambition and competency. And what we did, um, and then in both experiments you can see, um, what we did is um, we gave them a very generous knowledge radius, so they have a very, very good understanding of the entire world, uh, so they know where the good land is, and we gave them enough grain to get started so they can make it through the first few um, runs. And then we, did, we recorded the um, wealth inequality, uh, particularly we measured it uh, through the, uh, the Gini factor, and then we also looked at the demographic shift across settlements. Um, so I, I assume everyone knows what the uh, Gini coefficient is. Um, if not, I obviously don't have time to talk about it here. But um, what's more useful is to think about it in terms of, of comparison. So zero means totally equal. One or 100, depending on your scale um, or your units that you're using, is completely unequal. The most equal places currently right in the world are found in um, Europe and uh, Central Asia. Uh, with an index around 25 to 30. The most unequal are in Southern Africa with uh, uh, an index of 60 to 66. So keep those in mind for comparison. 
So um, I ran the model for 300 years. Um, for each experiment, I did 30 runs and then took an average um, of the values that were produced. And so for the kind of the control um, experiment, where all the agents are the best, uh, they all have equal ability. Um, as you can see, things are pretty equal, right? Uh, they have a, a, a Gini of you know, 20, it starts out about around 28, goes up to uh, maybe as, as high as 40 after 300 years. Uh, so that's, um, that's interesting in terms of that it is, we do have a steady um, rise over the um, period of 300 years, um, but not that dramatic. Uh, not surprisingly, in the experiment two that I'm giving you as an example, where you have more varied ambition and competency, you see a much, much higher Gini, um, a, a level of inequality much you know, similar to what we see, um, or even higher than what we see in Southern Africa. Um, but to go back to um, experiment one and how it's getting, it's getting um, bigger over time, you can see this kind of wealth shift um, more clearly in another um, reporter that I used. And this reporter that I used, I adapted from Walensky's wealth distribution model. And basically what you're looking at here is the pink line uh, is, to oversimplify it for time, the pink line is the upper class, the blue line is middle class, and the yellow is lower class. And it's all calculated on the basis of percentage of wealth of the wealthiest person. And as you can see around, and this is consistent in every single run, um, that somewhere around 150 to 200 years, we get a switch where you have a quite a high number of households who were in the middle class and a comparatively lower number of households in the lower class, it switches so that by you know, year 200, um, most of the households are in the lower class. Um, now in experiment two, it's exactly what you would expect. You have a high number of households in the lower class and very, very few households in the upper class. Um, in, as you say, the, in experiment two, these are the levels that you would um, probably expect to see based on the data we have from uh, the end of pre-dynastic Egypt and dynastic Egypt. That seems to be the kind of wealth distribution that we, would ha we had in, in ancient Egypt. Um, the other thing we evaluated was settlement population distribution. And um, you know, again, so in experiment one, the one where everyone's more equal, um, the population distribution doesn't change dramatically. Um, the minimum population, uh, sorry, so the, town, the, the towns with the smallest population, that number tended to be 36. Um, population 36, the mean population of all the settlements was 67, and the largest settlement um, had just 79 people. So not, dr not a hugely dramatic shift. And remember, they all started out at 35, all of them. When we get to experiment two, however, uh, we see a much more dramatic shift. So the mean is still, you know, is, um, is not so different. It's about 60 uh, per settlement, but the smallest settlements now have 13 people, and the largest settlement has 116, so in about nine times the size of the, of, of the smallest. Um, okay, so, right, and another way to visualize this data is um, through the actual um, net logo itself in the, in the display, and you can see, again, the difference, right, um, between the, the, the two examples and how we have this um, differentiation uh, with uh, the settlement sizes. Okay, so those were just two examples of many we've, we've done, but um, I wanted to kind of more move on to the flaws and problems with the model, of which there are many. <laughs> um, uh, but there's a few that right now are occupying uh, my mind. Um, the economy that I've modeled is obviously oversimplistic. There's a lot more going on um, than, than what I've shown. Um, another thing that I'm not sure how much of a problem it is, I'm gonna have to think about it more, is the issue of the floodplain. So as I said briefly in the beginning, I used NASA's data from 2000, right, to um, map out the elevation, the current elevations of the floodplain. But the floodplain today is very different, very, the floodplain today is different than the floodplain in antiquity, right, because, um, because of the Aswan High Dam, um, irrigation and the Nile flood is very much controlled. You don't have this annual dramatic flooding of um, the Nile Valley. And so the elevations are different, things are different, and I'm not sure, to, I'm not really, I'm not, I just don't know how much that would change what I've done. It's something I need to think about and, and figure out how I can um, evaluate that. Um, another problem, though, is, is that consistently throughout, whenever I run the model in, with all kinds of different variables, when I get large settlements, um, they're always ending up where the floodplain is the widest. Um, and that seems like it might make sense, because if the floodplain is wider, that means it's more cultivable land, um, so why wouldn't that be where the largest settlements are? 
the problem is, is that the data that we have, uh, such as it is, and it is um, fragmentary and problematic, uh, the data we have suggests otherwise. The largest cities that developed in Upper Egypt in the pre-dynastic period actually showed up where the floodplain is narrow. Uh, so one theory that has been put forward about that by an Egyptologist is that the areas where the floodplain is wide, that these basins, um, that such, such basin agriculture was harder to manage, right? That you had a much bigger space, that means much big, bigger flooding, and that it was just harder for uh, producers to um, manage and deal with that situation. That's a theory. Um, but it could be completely other reasons, right? It could have to do with um, nothing to do with agriculture. It could have to do with mineral resources, right? Or, um, or trade routes or something else. So that's something that I need to think about and work into the model more in the future. Uh, okay, so moving forward then, possible directions. I think we're still just very much at the very beginning um, stages of this project. Uh, how fast it moves forward it basically is dependent on how quickly I can learn how to code better um, than I can now. And how, I guess, how quickly I can learn Python so I can get away from that logo. Because even with this model, it takes forever to run these experiments. So um, I can't imagine what's going to happen when I try to do any of these things I've listed here. But possible ways we can move forward is, like I said, a more accurate environment, uh, household movements, uh, bring in uh, you know, alternative land tenure practices, uh, look at the negative effects of high flood. Right now in my model, you know, high flood is great, low flood is bad. But the reality is that a high flood could also be bad, depending on where you've built and what you're doing. Um, wider range of personality traits, um, specialization, and, and so forth. Um, and just, because uh, I think I have like one minute, right? Yeah, just to kind of then sum up my conclusions. Like I said, it's all very preliminary. But broadly, what we've been able to do with the model so far is to duplicate aspects of Kemp's conceptual model. Um, you know, not to the point to make it so that we have a single household rising above the others. The model's not designed uh, yet to do that. Uh, but the point of the model was to explore how changes in individual agents' behavior due to personality can have long-term effects over how a small-scale society de develops, um, and to explore methodological issues of bringing in more human-like characteristics into our simulations of the distant past. Uh, the point of the model is also to explore how economic inequality can emerge naturally from simple interaction with the variable environment rather than be imposed by a hostile or aggressive uh, force or hostile individuals, even in a, res re uh, even in a resource, resource rich environment like the Nile Valley. Thank you. Thank you.